Arthur's father had trained his uncle's horses, and he had grown up in the atmosphere of horse racing. On leaving college, he began to ride and train horses, and at 18, had received his trainer's license. Racing then was more of a sport than it is now. Stakes were smaller, and owners and trainers fraternized, celebrating their successes with banquets and receptions. There was not a great deal of gambling, and there was much innocent enjoyment in the merry-go-rounds and swings that were erected near to the racetrack. Two outstanding horses of the period were Mr. Jose Leandro de Montbrun's Vigilant, trained by Arthur and ridden by his brother, and Mr. D.C.C. da Costa's Hooten. The first race meeting in the Grand Savannah took place at Christmas in 1853. For 20 years and more, Arthur went about his business training horses and riding until increasing weight made him retire from being a jockey. He was appointed the secretary of the Breeders' Association, but he remained always a rather solitary man in his khaki trousers and khaki tunic, open at the neck, perhaps an inconspicuous figure of no real importance. During these 20 odd years, the town of Port of Spain was growing. In 1891, the Building and Loan Association was formed and the Chamber of Commerce incorporated. The Queen's Park Oval opened in 1895 and the streets of the town were lighted by electricity for the first time. The public library was opened in 1901 and the Queen's Royal College three years later. The former government buildings were destroyed by fire in the water riots on 23rd March 1903 to be replaced by the present block of buildings known as the Red House. In 1890, a royal commission had inquired into the desirability of representative government. Seven years later, another royal commission inquired into conditions in the West Indies. On January the 1st, 1889, Tobago became subordinate to Trinidad. And 10 years later, it became a ward of the combined colony of Trinidad and Tobago on January the 1st, 1899. In that year also, a reform movement delegation was sent to England. Before the end of the year, a serious blow was dealt to the desire for increased local government when the Port of Spain Borough Council was abolished and replaced by a board of town commissioners. And it was not until 1914, after a great deal of agitation and protest by the citizens of Port of Spain, chief among them, and the most eloquent being Mr. Prudham David, that the town board was abolished and an elected council as it exists today replaced it, the first mayor being Dr. E. Prada. The course of Arthur's life seemed settled. He saw his 39th birthday and was nearing 40 when World War I commenced on 4th August 1914. When the war was not yet two months old, a lecture, Sayings on War, was delivered by Mr. Algernon Burkett at St. Anne's Hall, Oxford Street, to help the Trinidad Breeders Association in their effort to buy a hundred cavalry horses for the British Army. Arthur Cipriani spoke on that occasion. His first public speech as follows. It is to those of you who, like me, are British subjects, not of English parentage, but of alien descent, and owe their protection to the British flag, that the appeal comes with greater force. I think it practical for us to send 100 cavalry horses. The very best we can do is to try to attain that end. And if we fail, we will still have the satisfaction of knowing that we had tried to do our duty. There then followed a long and bitter struggle by the people of Trinidad, led by Cipriani, and ably supported by the Port of Spain Gazette, to be allowed to play their part in the war as loyal members of the British Empire. 
the governor of Trinidad and his officials considered as absurd the idea of West Indian troops being sent abroad to fight for the empire. However, by the end of June 1915, Trinidad learned that contingents from the West Indies would be accepted by the home government. At the instigation of Cipriani, the Port of Spain Gazette turned its offices into an unofficial recruiting center. And in two days, there were over 1,000 names on the list. The first of these being Arthur Andrew Cipriani. Eventually, a public meeting was held in Marine Square, now Independence Square under the chairmanship of Dr. E. Prada, and Cipriani addressed the meeting as follows. If the West Indies claims a place in the sun, we must do our duty as a unit of the British Empire. It is true that we have formed the weakest link in the chain, but it is said that the weakest link is the strength of the chain. I was born and bred in this colony, and was read in it from childhood to youth, and from youth to manhood. I have shared your sorrows and your joys, and I appeal to you in the name of the king to enlist, and I do so irrespective of class, color, and creed. Cipriani helped in the recruitment of four contingents, and then decided to go to the front, refusing a request from the governor to stay and continue his recruiting work. There was some delay in his being commissioned, for he was already 40, and his state of health demanded an operation. But on 20th March, 1917, Lieutenant Cipriani left for Europe in command of the third contingent. On the 30th of April, Cipriani arrived in Egypt to find that the first, second, and fifth battalions of the British West Indian Regiment were there, while all the other battalions had been sent to France and turned into labor battalions. During the next two years, he defied military authority time and again to ensure that the BWIR was not abused and that it was given its rightful place among the fighting units of the empire. The war office simply could not accept that West Indians made good soldiers and preferred to use them for shell carrying and labor duties. Finally, the first and second battalions saw action on the Turkish front and acquitted themselves with distinction. It is proper to quote what Major General E. W. Chater wrote concerning them. Outside of my own division, there are no troops I would sooner have with me than the BWIR, who have won the highest opinion of all who have been with them during operations here. Cipriani had had great faith in his West Indian brothers of all classes, races, and creeds, and they had not failed him. In their turn, the rank and file of the BWIR never forgot the quiet, reserved man who, a mere captain, defied generals on their behalf. 